Hello everyone. Today we will discuss about ankle and foot kinesiology or biomechanics. So some of the basics we will be reviewing here that is we will be discussing about the basic anatomy of the foot and ankle. The term ankle primarily refers to the joint that is called as talocrural joint. Talocrural joint is formed by the bones which are talus, tibia and fibula. So you can see the picture here the talocrural joint is formed between the upper articulating surface or the dome of the talus also called as trochlear notch of the talus and some part of the fibula and some part of the tibia. So this is called as ankle joint or talocrural joint. The foot refers to all the bones and the structures after the talocrural joint or distal to the ankle joint. We can divide foot into three sections. You can see here first one the nude color is the rear foot, uh, middle one the blue color is the midfoot and the gray color is the forefoot. So the hind foot or also called as rear foot consists of the talus and the calcaneum bone as you can see here the talus and the calcaneum bone this hind foot also consists of the subtalar joint that is the joint formed between the talus and the calcaneum bone so if somebody asks you about the subtalar joint then you have to remember that the joint is formed by the talus and the calcaneum if somebody asks you about the ankle joint then it is a talocrural joint between the talus, tibia and fibula. Now next what is midfoot? The midfoot, what does midfoot consist of? Midfoot consists of the navicular bone, the cuboid bone, the cuneiform bone which are the medial three cuneiform bones. We have three cuneiform bones, one cuboid and one navicular bone. These are called as tarsal bones. So the joints forming uh, between the calcaneum and the cuboid that is calcaneum cuboid joint and the talonavicular joint is also coming under the midfoot and all the joints form between the navicular and the cuneiform cuneiform in the cuboid and cuboid and the navicular bone this also comes under midfoot now next is the forefoot as you can see the gray section of the uh, foot this is called as forefoot which consists of the metatarsals phalanges so we have five metatarsals five proximal phalanges four middle phalanges and five distal phalanges now let's review the bone one by one just the basic about the bone to understand the joints and later on we can discuss the osteokinematics so the first bone is the fibula so you can see here the picture red color it is thinner than the tibia so the fibula is a long and thin bone and it transfers only 10 percent of the body weight it ends distally with the formation of lateral malleolus here you can see the lateral malleolus which is the projection on the lateral side of the foot which is the projection of the fibula called as lateral malleolus the lateral malleolus functions as a pulley for the muscles, especially the peroneus muscle and the distal surface has an attachment or a facet for the talus on the medial side as well as for the tibia. The next bone is the tibia. The distal tibia ends with the formation of medial malleolus. We had discussed that the fibula ends with the lateral malleolus. Similarly, the uh, tibia ends with the medial malleolus which is palpable on the medial side of the ankle joint. The medial malleolus transfers 90% of the load to the ankle joint. So therefore this is the primary bone which takes weight. It has one notch for talus and one for the fibula. So you can see here on the lateral side it has a notch for the uh, fibula and on the uh, inferior side it has a notch for the talus. Next bone and very important bone is the talus. So the some of the important parts of talus is the 
trochlear surface which is the superior surface as we talked about previously it is the dome shaped uh, surface which articulates with the tibia to form the dilocral joint or ankle joint it has a head anteriorly which articulates with the navicular bone it has a neck and it has importantly three facets which is anterior middle and posterior facets this anterior middle and posterior facets are situated inferiorly and it articulates with the calcaneum bone to form the subtalar joint next bone is the calcaneum the calcaneus has a calcaneal tuberosity which is important for the attachment of the achilles tendon the tendon which is the elongation of the gastro soleus muscle the calcaneus also has an anterior middle and posterior facets which are situated on the superior surface of the calcaneum this anterior middle and posterior facets articulates with the anterior middle and posterior facets of the talus so the anterior middle and posterior facets of the talus are situated inferiorly whereas anterior middle and posterior facets of the calcaneum are situated superiorly so this articulation forms the subtalar joint the calcaneus also has a, a projection which is prominent and is called as sustentaculum talus the next bone is a navicular bone the name comes from its shape which is navy or it looks like a ship and it has three facets anteriorly here you can see it has a three facets which articulates with the cuneiform posteriorly it articulates with the head of the talus where its surface or the articulating surface is concave whereas the head of the talus is convex the next bone is the cuneiform bone we have three cuneiform bone and this all comes under the tarsal bones uh, the cuneiform bone we have medial intermediate and lateral cuneiform bone and the most lateral bone is called as the cuboid now further anteriorly we have metatarsals we have five metatarsals further anterior to metatarsals we have proximal phalanges we have intermediate phalanges and we have five distal phalanges so let's review the joints now coming to the joints the proximal tibiofibular joint or also called as superior tibiofibular joint is identical to our superior radial nerve joint this proximal or superior tibiofibular joint is formed between the proximal uh, end of the fibula and the proximal end of the tibia so the bony components are the proximal end of the fibula and proximal end of the tibia the head of the fibula and the lateral condyle of the tibia articulates to form tibiofibular joint now coming to in inferior or distal tibiofibular joint again the bony components are the tibia and fibula but it is the distal end of the fibula and the distal end of the tibia and it is formed between the medial surface of the fibula and the fibular notch of the tibia which is facing laterally uh, we also have a syndesmosis or a bond by a interosseous membrane between the fibula and the tibia so these are two joints which are proximal to the ankle joint or talocrural joint which is called as tibiofibular joint there is a little movement permitted in this uh, joint as it is strongly supported by the ligaments now next important joint is the talocrural joint as we have already known that talocrural joint is the ankle joint and the bony components forming the ankle joint or the talocrural joint is the dome shaped trochlea of the talus or the superior articulating surface of the talus and side of the talus which articulate with the tibia it articulates with the rectangular cavity formed by the distal tibia and fibula which is also called as mortis so the lateral uh, so the lateral as you can see here uh, which i'm drawing the sketch 
the lateral malleolus and this articulating surface and the medial malleolus, the tibia and the fibula forms a shape which is a rectangular type of cavity inferiorly this is called as mortis so this articulates with the upper dome or the trochlea of the talus bone a thin capsule surrounds this joint to reduce any type of friction the reinforcement by the medial and lateral collateral ligament stabilizes and supports the joint you can see here in the picture above this is the medial collateral ligament which is also called as deltoid ligament it has a three slip uh, connecting from the calcaneum navicular and the talus to the tibia inferiorly you can see the lateral collateral ligament which is the posterior tibiofibular ligament anterior tibiofibular ligament and calcaneofibular ligament now coming to subtalar joint the subtalar joint as we already know is formed between the talus and the calcaneum so we also have further discussed that the calcaneum has uh, three facets superiorly that is anterior facet middle facet and posterior facet similarly the talus also has inferiorly three facets anterior facet middle facet and posterior facets so these three facets articulate with each other that is anterior facet of the talus articulate with anterior facets of the calcaneum middle facet of the talus articulate with the middle facet of the calcaneum and posterior facet of the talus articulate with posterior facet of the calcaneum so this forms the subtalar joint the 70 percentage of the joint formed by the posterior facet as you can see it is large this joint is enclosed by capsules and reinforced by ligaments such as lateral middle and posterior talo calcaneal ligament now next coming to talo navicular joint the talo navicular joint is part of transverse tarsal joint it is formed between the talus and the navicular bone you can see here the joint formed between the talus and the navicular bone the anterior surface or the head of the talus is convex whereas the navicular bone articulating with the talus is concave the ligaments the important ligament that support this joint inferiorly is called as spring ligament or plantar calcaneo navicular ligament this is an important ligament which you can see here in this picture this ligament which supports from inferiorly when we are standing this ligament uh, prevents the talus displacing from the navicular bone so therefore this ligament is important for maintaining the arch of the foot now next is the calcaneo cuboid joint the calcaneo cuboid joint is formed between the calcaneum and the cuboid bone uh, you can see here laterally so the bony components are the calcaneus and the cuboid there is very less motion and the ligaments are supporting this joint firmly other joints are the cuneo navicular joint which is formed between the navicular bone and the cuneiforms then we have cuboid navicular joint which is formed between, between the cuboid and the navicular bone then we have intercuneiform joints you can see here intercuneiform joints and we have cuno cuboid joint there is a tarsal metatarsal joint which we know that is the joint between the tarsal bone and the metatarsal bones we have metatarsal phalangeal joint and the interphalangeal joint so these are some of the basic anatomy which we have discussed today and i hope you will be reading about it thoroughly especially the ligaments which support all this joint you can also refer the biomechanics book or kinesiology book which is joint structure and function by Cynthia Norkin as well as the uh, book by Donald A. Newman thank you hello everyone
Previously, we discussed about the basic anatomy of ankle joint and foot. Now, let us discuss the osteokinematics of talocrural joint. Osteokinematics means we need to learn about the movements which occurs between the bone or at the joint. It's a plane and axis at which the movement occurs and the range of motion. So the movement occurring at the talocrural joint are the dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So we can discuss the osteokinematic in open kinematic chain and closed kinematic chain. So during open kinematic chain, the talus along with the foot moves on the tibia. Whereas in closed kinematic chain, the tibia moves on the talus because the foot will be fixed on the ground. So these are the two differences and uh, because of these differences the arthrokinematics will be different during open kinematic chain and during closed kinematic chain. This dorsiflexion and plantar flexion occurs in sagittal plane and coronal axis and the range of motion is about 20 degree of dorsiflexion and about 0 to 50 degree of plantar flexion. Before moving on to arthrokinematics of the talocrural joint, we have to understand the surface of the talus which articulates with the tibia is convex whereas the tibial surface which articulates with the talus is concave. Now we need to understand the concave convex rule that is when concave moves on convex surface, the sliding will be towards the same direction to the movement of the bone. And when the convex surface is moving on concave, the sliding will be in the opposite direction to the movement of the bone. Now let us discuss the arthrokinematic during open kinematic chain movement at the talocrural joint. Uh, during open kinematic chain, the talus will move on tibia. So during dorsiflexion, the talus moves superiorly or rolls superiorly and the surface of the talus slides inferiorly because the surface of the talus is convex therefore it will slide opposite to the direction of its movement during plantar flexion the talus rolls inferiorly and its surface on the tibia slides superiorly during close kinematic chain the tibia will move on talus that means the concave surface will move on convex surface so during dorsiflexion the tibia will move anteriorly and its surface also will slide anteriorly because the surface of the tibia is concave during plantar flexion the tibia will move posteriorly and its surface also will slide posteriorly Moving on to osteokinematics of the subtalar joint. The movement occurring at the subtalar joint is primarily eversion and inversion. But the inversion and eversion occurs along with the adduction and abduction of the foot. So these are the inversion and eversion at the subtalar joint which causes the foot to invert and evert. So this movement occurs in coronal plane and sagittal axis and the range of motion is about 23 degree of inversion and 12 degree of eversion. Let us understand the arthrokinematics at the subtalar joint. As we know the subtalar joint is formed between the talus and the calcaneum. We know that it is formed by attachment of the anterior, middle and posterior facets of talus and calcaneum. We also know that the posterior facet comprises of the 70 percentage of the joint and the posterior facet of the calcaneum is convex whereas the posterior facet of the talus is concave. So during closed kinematic chain talus moves on calcaneum and during open kinematic chain the calcaneum moves on talus. So let's discuss the open kinematic chain to understand the arthrokinematics of the subtalar joint. During inversion, when the calcaneum moves inward, that is medially, its surface will slide laterally because the surface of the 
calcaneum which is articulating with the talus is convex the surface which articulates is the posterior facet of the calcaneum and during eversion that is movement of the calcaneum laterally its facet surface will slide medially so you can imagine the close kinematic chain movement where talus moves on calcaneum I won't be mentioning right now because it may be confusing between the open kinematic chain and closed kinematic chain so for now we will be discussing only open kinematic chain for subtalar joint now moving on to transverse tarsal joint osteokinematics here the movement is adduction and abduction which is very minimal and it moves along with the subtalar joint inversion and eversion so this combined movement of inversion and eversion along with adduction and abduction of foot is also called as supination and pronation in some other books so the transverse tarsal joint is the joint between the uh, navicular bone and the talus and cuboid and the calcaneum the navicular bone and the talus joint is called as talo navicular joint and between the cuboid and the calcaneus is called as calcaneo cuboid joint so you can imagine during eversion uh, the first picture you can see during eversion calcaneum and the navicular bone moves laterally and during inversion the calcaneum and navicular bone moves medially now coming to arthrokinematics of the transverse tarsal joint the navicular bone will slightly spin on the head of the talus and slide laterally during eversion and during inversion it will spin on the head of the talus and slide medially during inversion coming to combined osteokinematics of the talocrural subtalar and transverse tarsal joint when the uh, talocrural joint goes for plantar flexion along with inversion at the subtalar joint and adduction at the transverse tarsal joint it is called as supination and it is called as pronation when the talocrural joint goes for dorsiflexion subtalar joint goes for eversion and transverse tarsal joint goes for abduction the next joint is the tarsal metatarsal joint which is distal to the transverse tarsal joint there is not much movement at this joint as it is firmly stabilized by the ligaments around it but there will be some movement if the transverse tarsal motion is inadequate so this tarso metatarsal joint will rotate to provide further adjustment during walking when the transverse tarsal joint is inadequate let us understand further osteokinematics at the foot there are two important topics which is supination twist pronation twist and metatarsal break so when does the supination twist occur it occurs when we are weight bearing so when we are weight bearing the foot will try to flatten on the ground there will be pronation or there will be eversion of the subtalar joint causing the lateral aspect of the foot to raise off the ground whereas the medial aspect of the foot that is forefoot will be pressed on the ground so there won't be equal surfacing of the foot on the ground therefore the supination twist will occur so what is supination twist so as i told you the hind foot pronates or everts in weight bearing position because of which the forefoot on the lateral aspect will be raised from the ground and forefoot on the medial aspect will be pressed on the ground to prevent this tarso metatarsal joint will go for slight supination so that the lateral aspect of the forefoot will touch the ground this slight adjustment at the tarso metatarsal joint will cause the plantar aspect of the foot to be in contact with the ground for this slight supination twist to occur at the tarso metatarsal joint the first and second tarso metatarsal joints should go for dorsiflexion and fourth and fifth tarso metatarsal joint should go for plantar flexion so again i would like to repeat again the supination twist during weight bearing the subtalar joint or the hind foot will go pronate 
which will cause the lateral aspect of the foot to raise off the ground and the medial aspect of the foot at the forefoot to compress at the ground. To prevent the lateral aspect of the foot to be raised, the tarso metatarsal joint here at this level, the tarso metatarsal joint will go for supination, which is called a supination twist so that the lateral aspect of the foot also touches the ground along with the medial aspect of the foot. Now just opposite to this supination twist is called as pronation twist. In pronation twist, the hind foot is locked in supination where the forefoot tends to lift off on the medial aspect that is in this aspect, the medial side of the forefoot tends to raise because of the supination at the hind foot whereas the lateral aspect of the foot will be compressed on the ground to prevent this again the tarso metatarsal joint will go for supination uh, pronation twist to counter the rotation caused by the supination of the hind foot uh, so because of this pronation twist the medial aspect of the foot also will touch the ground along with the lateral aspect of the foot so for this pronation twist to occur the first and second tarso metatarsal joint should go for plantar flexion and fourth and fifth tarso metatarsal joint should go for dorsiflexion moving on to metatarso phalangeal joint which is a condyloid synovial joint the metatarsal head is convex and the base of the proximal phalanx which connect with the metatarsal head is concave it has a 2 degree of freedom which is flexion of 0 to 30 degree and extension of 0 to 80 degree and abduction of 0 to 15 degree and adduction of 0 to 20 degree. The important point here to understand is the metatarsal break. So what is metatarsal break? You can see in the second picture for the heel to be raised metatarsophalangeal joint should go for extension and when it is extended enough it will create a break so that the heel is raised comfortably without foot being slipped so this is called as metatarsal break it is a break that occurs at the metatarsophalangeal joint as the heel raises while the metatarsal head and toe remain weight bearing so during this the metatarsophalangeal joint has to extend which occurs around the oblique axis you can see here the axis which runs from the second to fifth metatarsophalangeal heads it is about 54 to 73 degree you can see here 54 to 70 de 73 degree and this degree of this oblique axis is important so that the weight is distributed all over the metatarsal heads so without this uh, metatarsal break the plantar flexors cannot lift the heel completely so if uh, the metatarsophalangeal joint extension is restricted the lifting of the heel Will be difficult. This metatarsophalangeal joint is like a fulcrum for the heel to be lifted and for a person to propel forward during walking. So as I've already mentioned the oblique orientation of the axis where the metatarsophalangeal joint extends will allow the distribution of the weight throughout the heads of the metatarsals. Now during extension the metatarsal will move on phalanx because it is a closed kinematic chain and we know the articulating surface of the head of the metatarsal is convex therefore the convex will move on concave. During extension the metatarsal head will roll anteriorly whereas its surface will slide posteriorly because its surface is convex moving on the concave surface of the phalanx. Coming to interphalangeal joint, there is not much to discuss here. It is a, there are proximal and distal interphalangeal joint which are synovial hinge type of joint. It has only one degree of freedom which is flexion of 0 to 50 degree and extension of 0 50 to 0 degree. So we have discussed some important topics here which are supination twist, pronation twist and metatarsal break. So I would like you all to read through the books and understand it in depth so that it can be used in our clinical practice.
Thank you. Hello everyone. So now we will discuss about the muscles of the ankle and foot or the muscles which create movement at the ankle and other joints of the foot. The muscles are divided into different compartments. It is divided into four compartments, the anterior compartment muscles, the lateral compartment muscles and the posterior compartment muscles which are divided into two, the superficial posterior compartment and the deep posterior compartment. And all the compartments are divided and surrounded by fascia. The anterior compartment muscles are mostly dorsiflexors. Those are tibialis anterior, extensor digitorum longus, extensor hallucis and peroneus tertius. The lateral compartment muscles are mostly everters and those are the peroneus longus and peroneus brevis. Other muscles are from the posterior compartment. The superficial posterior compartment muscles are mostly plantar flexors. Those are gastronemius, soleus and plantaris. And the deep posterior compartment muscles are the flexor digitorum longus, flexor hallucis and tibialis posterior muscles. Now let's discuss one by one. First we will discuss is about the anterior compartment muscles which are mostly the dorsiflexors. The tibialis anterior muscle is the dorsi main dorsiflexor of the foot. It gets originated from the upper two-third of the anterior lateral surface of the tibia. You can see here the upper two-third of the anterior lateral surface of the tibia and you can see its insertion is on the base of the first metatarsal and medial cuneiform. So you can see here the insertion at the base of the first metatarsal. So we need to note that this uh, muscle passes anterior to the medial malleolus. So according to its vector, we can predict its action. So therefore, the action of this muscle would be dorsiflexion along with inversion. So dorsiflexion along with inversion of the foot. Next muscle is the extensor digitorum longus. This gets originated from the lateral condyle of the tibia and anterior surface of the fibula. You can see here lateral condyle of the tibia and anterior surface of the fibula. Its insertion is mostly on the lateral aspect of the foot. So this muscle crosses through the ankle joint through all the joints passes through all the joints of the foot and gets attached to the middle and distal phalanx of the lateral toes so this is basically a lateral muscle so therefore its action would be dorsiflexion with eversion and also it will have two extension because it has attached till the distal phalanx of the toe except for the greater toe Next muscle is the extensor hallucis longus. This muscle originates from the middle two-third of the inner surface of front of the fibula. Then it elongates as a tendon and gets inserted to the top of the distal phalanx of the great toe. You can see here distal phalanx of the great toe. So we can predict the function of this muscle. Its elongation is oblique from lateral to medial so therefore it will create a dorsiflexion because it crosses through the ankle joint and also it will create the extension of the greater toe because it has attachment on the distal aspect of the greater toe and also it will create some amount of inversion of the foot so the action is the extension of the great toe dorsiflexion of the ankle and weak inversion of the foot. Next muscle is the peroneus tertius muscle. It originates from the lower fibula and it gets inserted on the dorsal surface of the fifth metatarsal. So you can see here the insertion is on the fifth metatarsal. So this is a lateral muscle therefore its action would be dorsiflexion because it crosses the ankle joint from the anterior aspect of the foot 
and also it can create eversion because it is attached on the lateral aspect of the foot on the fifth metatarsal. So the action of this muscle is eversion and dorsiflexion. Now let's move on to lateral compartment of the leg. The lateral compartment muscle are pernis longus and pernis brevis. The pernis longus muscle originates from the head of the upper two-third of the outer surface of the fibula. You can see here upper two-third of the outer surface of the fibula then it gets inserted on the first cuneiform and first metatarsal bone. So you can see it elongates as the tendon goes posterior to the lateral malleolus. You can see on the second animated video here it goes underneath the foot. So you can see below here underneath the foot you can see it is attached on the first metatarsal and on the first cuneiform. So this muscle comes from lateral and goes to medial aspect of the foot from the underneath of the foot. So the action of this muscle would be plantar flexion because it is coming from the posterior aspect of the uh, posterior aspect of the lateral malleolus and also it will, call, it will cause eversion because it is entering the sole of the foot from the lateral aspect. So it can cause eversion as well as plantar flexion of the foot. The next muscle is the perineus brevis muscle. It originates from the lower two-third of the outer surface of the fibula. Its insertion is on the dorsal surface of the fifth metatarsal. You can see here it doesn't go underneath the foot on the medial aspect. It will be inserting on the lateral aspect itself on the fifth metatarsal. It also passes through the posterior aspect of the lateral malleolus. Therefore, its action would be similar to the longus, that is plantar flexion and eversion of the foot. Moving on to posterior compartment muscles. The first muscle is the largest muscle of the posterior compartment and the largest muscle of the leg, that is the gastronemius muscle. So gastronemius muscle has two belly, you can see in the picture here, two belly, the medial and the lateral. It originates from the posterior surface of the two femur condyles. You can see here, it originates from the two femur condyles and it gets inserted to the posterior surface of the calcaneus via Achilles tendon. So the action of this muscle could be flexion at the knee joint because it crosses the knee joint and also it dorsiflexion of the ankle joint because it crosses the ankle joint. So these are the main actions of this muscle that is plantar flexion of the foot and flexion of the knee. Next muscle is the soleus muscle. It is located beneath the gastronemius muscle and the origin of this muscle is from the two-third of the posterior surface of the tibia and fibula. So this is not coming from the femur, it is coming from the tibia and fibula, therefore it won't have any action on the knee joint. This muscle gets inserted along with gastronemius through the Achilles tendon on the posterior surface of the calcaneus. The action of this muscle is same as gastronemius for ankle joint, that is plantar flexion, but it won't, it won't have any action on the knee joint. So gastronemius and soleus together is called as triceps sure of the lower limb because it has three bellies, two bellies from the gastronemius and one belly from the soleus. And all these three bellies unite together as an Achilles tendon and gets inserted on the calcaneus. Why the name Achilles for the tendon? Because the Achilles tendon is named after the Greek mythological figure called Achilles who was the bravest and the strongest of the Greek warrior in the Trojan War. So this Achilles could be killed only if the arrow or the sword hits the gastrosoleus tendon because his mother dipped him into the river Styx and he was vulnerable only at the hill by which she had held him while she was dipping him in the river. So this is a mythological story and uh, therefore the tendon is named after Achilles. 
So this Achilles tendon is the largest tendon of the body. It can withstand around 1000 pounds of force. So this is a tendon, a uh, common tendon for the gastrocnemius and soleus. Next muscle of the posterior compartment is plantaris which may be absent in some humans. It originates from the lateral epicondyle of the femur and gets inserted to the calcaneus same as gastrosoleus. The action of this muscle is plantar flexion. Now moving on to deep posterior compartment. The first muscle is the tibialis posterior muscle. It originates from the posterior surface of the upper half of the adjacent surface of tibia and fibula. So you can see here posterior surface of the upper half of the tibia and fibula and it gets inserted on the navicular cuneiform cuboid bone and base of the second to fifth metatarsal bone. So this insertion is difficult to remember. You can see the muscle passes posteriorly and gets inserted to the navicular bone, cuboid bone, cuneiforms and the base of second to fifth metatarsal bone. So the action of this muscle is plantar flexion and inversion of the foot. Coming to flexor digitorum longus which is also the deep posterior compartment muscle. It originates from the middle one third of the posterior surface of the tibia. You can see middle one third of the posterior surface of the tibia and it gets inserted to the base of the distal phalanx of each of the lateral four toes. You can see here again it goes through the same path but gets inserted on the base of the distal phalanx of the each lateral four toes. So what would be the function of this muscle? It will be similar to the previous muscle that is plantar flexion, toe flexion and inversion of the foot. So the additional function that this muscle has is toe flexion because its attachment is till the distal phalanx of the second to fifth toe. Next muscle is flexor hallucis longus. It gets originated from the middle half of the posterior surface of the fibula and then it gets inserted to the distal phalanx of the greater toe. So the action of this muscle would be plantar flexion flexion of the great toe because it is passing through the uh, plantar surface of the foot till the distal phalanx of the great toe. So therefore it will create flexion of the great toe and also inversion of the foot because it is coming towards the medial aspect of the foot. So this were some of the muscles from the lower limb which creates movement at the ankle joint and other joints of the foot. Thank you.